All right, well, it is 11 o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, good morning or afternoon if you are on the East Coast. Uh, thank you for joining us for our latest webcast, Ransomware Attacks, Are You Prepared? Here is a quick look at today's agenda. I'll go ahead and do some brief introductions and then we will spend the majority of our time uh, with our guest and finish up with some designated Q&A time at the end. If you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please go ahead and submit those through the Q&A or chat portals and we will make sure to get to those at the end. So to kick things off, let me tell you a little bit about Liberty Advisors. We are 100% independent business management consulting firm founded in 1995. We have a team of expert consultants averaging 20 plus years of experience who specialize in business process improvement, ERP evaluation, selection and implementation, as well as other technology advisory services such as uh, ransom recovery, which is why we're here uh, today. So a quick look at the specific services. Uh, we do offer a variety of services from the core ERP and BPR services to other value added services such as such as ransomware recovery, IT security advisory, interim CIO, project rescue, et cetera. Today, I'm thrilled that we are gonna be joined by LTA senior consultant, Nicole Calcaterra. Uh, you can have a look at Nicole's bio here on the screen. Nicole has an extensive background, including IT director, application development, BI manager, and vice president of IT before joining uh, the team here at LTA. Nicole also recently led a successful ransomware recovery project for a client and got them back up and running across dozens of locations in a timely manner um, while ensuring that they could uh, continue running their business. So um, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to Nicole. So Nicole, welcome. Thanks, Brad. Um, just making sure, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Well, I think the way that, you know, we wanted to approach this uh, discussion was kind of, you know, it's, it's almost, are you prepared, but then, you know, what happens should you be um, impacted by uh, an attack? So, the, you know, you can never be 100% prepared probably, but uh, we thought we'd talk about maybe some high level best practices and then uh, we can get into a little bit about um, what it might be like uh, should you should you be attacked and it's kind of a scary statistic if you think about it there's I think in 2019 there were over 50 percent of um, um, there's a, a lot of small businesses that were you know forced to pay hackers um, on their stolen data and there were many uh, school districts affected as well as government organizations so it's um, you know you kind of walk around with that feeling of it'll never happen to me don't worry about it um, but in all actuality, it, it, it's more common than people think. So um, I thought we'd start with um, just kind of talking about the network side of things a little bit and how, you know, a lot of people just plug their computers in and they think, oh, no worries, you know, I've got my laptop or I've got my, you know, desktop computer plugged in or, you know, but they really don't think about the engineering that goes into the back end of that. You know, how are we subdivided? Um, part of that it could be you could have your applications on one group uh, of your local area network. You could have your wired on another group and your wireless and your voices on another group. And what this does is it, if, if you were impacted, you can almost isolate that impaction point to a small subset group of nodes. And so that's really helpful to where it doesn't spread across your entire organization. So especially if you've got locations all over the country or state or city, whatever your setup might be, um, you want to think about that type of um, configuration because, uh, again, um, instead of spreading it across the entire organization, let's keep it to maybe um, a small group of uh, end nodes. Uh, another nice little, you know, uh, port restriction. You know, you can ensure that maybe your applications are only communicating on certain ports. There's no reason 
um, to open up all your ports. And this, these are all on the firewall networking side. So when I say that all the engineering is behind the scenes, it's really about the segmentation and the port restrictions. So um, these two kind of work hand in hand. Uh, so uh, firewall tightening the rules and regular monitoring. Um, I think those top three are really um, the the things that nobody really sees happen. So um, from an Active Directory um, perspective, group policies. Uh, so for instance, if I'm Nicole Calcaterra and you know I'm logging into my um, LTA domain controller. Uh, as an end user, my organization can, you know, force my endpoint, my computer, uh, to have certain antivirus on it. It could force it to follow certain rules. It could force it to, you know, be connected to certain peripherals. So if you try to administer a lot of your rules and restrictions and security policies through group policy, that's another great way to reduce uh, your vulnerability to the outside world. Um, you know, antivirus, that's another obvious, you know, point, make sure it's up to date, you know, configure uh, having, you know, regular coverage discussions with your provider because you don't just sign up for antivirus. There's different lines of coverage um, that you want to consider for your organization uh, based on size and, you know, location and uh, whether or not you want to have additional, number six, you know, additional endpoint protection. Um, a lot of people don't know that, you know, antivirus, you know, it's, it isn't always a local solution. There's also, you know, endpoint protection, which offers a more, you know, comprehensive system um, of, you know, different security techniques that antivirus just focuses typically on a singular um, endpoint. So some IT organizations, I do believe that this is sort of a personal discussion that every organization can have with their antivirus um, provider. Uh, but you know, people should know that there are multiple layers of protection that your organization can ensure themselves with. Uh, for instance, if, you know, I can give you an example. Uh, you know. I've got endpoint protection running on my computer and it's essentially administered from you know, my engineering team. Uh, and I open up a document and it suspects that there's something not right about what I'm opening. Uh, my endpoint protection, because on the final you know, end point, hence the name, it will completely, you can configure it to completely shut down that computer. You can lock that user out. You can really have full control of that endpoint that most antivirus um, you know, software doesn't provide. Uh, so again, I think it's kind of a personal preference with some organizations and how sophisticated they want to be. Um, another great best practice is maintenance. You know, what is your regular maintenance schedule? You know, for your operating systems, for your application patches security, even your firmware updates. You know, so if you walk into any network room and you look at all the hardware that's sitting there, is it running on the latest and greatest firmware? Um, you know, people sort of don't realize that even your hardware needs to have its firmware updated. Um, so are those regular scheduled um, windows occurring? Most typically go monthly, um, but there might be some hot patches and things you want to consider. Um, so maintenance is a really uh, good form of protection, obviously, best practice. Um, switches at workstations, you see this a lot um, in some of the smaller, mid-sized, and even larger organizations where maybe um, they've, they've outgrown their space and, you know, they're just trying to plug it, something in, you know, to get that internet connection. And you'll see little, you know, little tiny switches at people's desks, and it's this daisy chain model that, um, it makes it really hard for the IT team to control that endpoint because it's not a port that they're actually administering. So that's another thing as you walk around your office and you look and see, well, do I've got a lot of these little smaller appliances sitting around? You know, I don't think my IT no team knows about that. Do you really want to be plugged directly into a wall that's being managed you know, by a switch um, in your data center? Uh, of bring your own device, BYOD. Um, again, some organizations I've seen it both ways where, you know, this is 
how they operate. They, you know, they'd rather people bring their own devices, but they're set up for that. Um, most companies don't have a BYOD policy, so you can, and this is where the VLAN segmentation of a number one comes into play, because you can isolate a certain portion of your network to allow like your customers and your clients to come in. You can allow them to connect to that certain uh, segment of your network safely without impacting your network. So people's cell phones, um, things like that that aren't company provided, uh, you can isolate those off. So um, I, I think number nine and number one kind of really play well together. Um, and then passwords. I mean, this is so simple, but it's surprising how you can walk around and, you know, you'll see people write their passwords down on the bottom of their monitor or they put it in their desk or maybe it's under their keyboard. Or, but maybe practicing even more stricter, you know, minimum requirements. Off, change it often, 30, 60, 90 days. So simple little practices like that can make a big difference um, in, in a lot of organizations. Um, I think we can, yeah. Um, on the applications and the email side of the world, um, another really easy, uh, I think, level of, of security on the email side, because a lot of intrusions do happen through email, is multi-factor authentication. Uh, it's super easy to set up, especially if you're an Office 365 customer these days, and even with a Gmail, uh, Google. Uh, it's very easy to administer, and what it does is I'm the end user, I sign in with my password, but it's gonna force me to reconfirm who I am through another form of authentication, whether it's a text message to my mobile number that has been configured under my user account by the IT administration team, or by an app that I have to download on my phone and I, you know, scan a barcode, So there's, or you can get a voice call. Um, so there's multiple ways that you can set up that dual authentication, and it's definitely worth it um, because you know these threat actors they can come in and pose to be you and once they're in they're in if they didn't have to dual authenticate themselves then you know even better for them so um, spam filtering um, I think this is a pretty well practiced in most organizations but again you know be better you know, super aggressive with how you block file extensions um, you know today with macros and uh, VBA code being kind of nested in Word documents and Excel files, you know, maybe you can consider blocking certain DOCs um, because they can contain macros where DOCX cannot. So that's just a small example where, you know, you'd rather be a little bit tighter up front and loosen the reins downstream um, versus letting anything through. Uh, proactively send alerts to the end users. I mean, communication is the best form of you know, letting your users know what the latest scams are. So whether it's a daily, weekly, monthly, uh, whatever it calls for, let your end users know, inform them. Um, have Get them in the best practice of knowing how to inform themselves of, of what's out there. Um, something I've seen at several customers is if the business doesn't have the tools that they need to get their job done, They'll typically go outside of, you know, IT protocols, sadly, and, you know, they'll use uh, free stuff like Google Docs or Smartsheet, things like that, where they can collaborate with their coworkers. And they're not realizing that if they're working in an industry of, you know, sensitive data, like patient payment information or even consumer information, if that's outside your network, you want to avoid, um, you know, those types of practices. So, um, you know, another thing to keep an eye out for. Um, consider tougher restrictions on your website browsing by your end users. You know, certain departments probably need a little bit more flexibility with where they're browsing. You know, marketing is a great example of, you know, people who probably need a little bit of leeway, uh, like YouTube channels and things like that, but no reason to give those permissions out to, you know, folks in accounting or folks that are on the financial side of the world probably don't need as loose restrictions. Um, so where you can tighten some, some holes, you know, these are great areas to, to consider. Um, file sharing is another good one where, you know, does everybody need full access to a certain folder? You can 
you know, segment your business groups up, but then maybe you've got the manager level, the director level, VP level, you know, think of segregation of duty. Do all those levels need to have full read write access to, you know, every file in that folder? Um, if somebody's not living and breathing in the folder every day and who knows what they're downloading in their email and they save an attachment, um, the less access isn't, you know, sometimes can be uh, uh, better. Um, and then obviously, you know, when you're working with a customer or a client or a colleague, you know, be careful when you open up those Word documents and Excel documents that you're sharing between them. You know, take an extra step of scanning the document, although most, you know, email applications will do that for you automatically when it's coming through the server side, it's still a best practice um, and that's another great place where the endpoint protection will come into play. But, you know, give it another scan prior to executing it. So again, high level, you know, precautions to take, but, you know, you'd be surprised how easy um, simple intrusions can, you know, find their way in. And then, you know, you got to prepare for the worst that could happen. Um, you know, documentation, everybody hates documentation. They hate maintaining it, um, but it's the best form of protection, in my personal opinion, having that playbook ready uh, to go just in case. You know, obviously, the first and foremost thing, have backups, regular, off-site. Think about full and transactional. Um, and don't forget to test your backups. Um, you know, you might have good intentions that you're backing up the right databases and then you go to restore them and you realize, oh, you know, we've been backing up the wrong database for, you know, the year and not even realize that because you've never had to go through the practice of having to restore it. I mean, it's always great when you don't have to use your backups, but, um, you know, it's just something you want to make sure that you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's on. So. Um, if you have the luxury of having multiple backups on different locations, you know, when you're saving your backups, probably not a good idea to have them on the exact same server or data center that you're, you know, operating your production environment on. Have them off-site in a data center. Maybe if you're in a uh, hosted environment, you want to check your policy. Where are they backing up your data to? How many different redundancy locations are there? So read the fine print on that one, familiarize yourself on where your backups are going, how often they're going. But this one kind of plays into number five, which I'll get into a little bit later. But with the full and the transactional backups, you know, this is again another strategy that you want to have with your business. You know, what is the right recovery point and recovery time? So full backups are your entire, say, database database, whereas transactional, um, you know, might only get you, uh, it, it's every transactional level. So it's, uh, I'll get into that a little bit later in number five. Um, another great thing to have around is the network topology. Okay, it's, it's so worth it to have a visual understanding of what servers you have, where you have them, what peripherals are connected to the network. This means physical servers, virtual servers, your VMware, where are my switches, where are my routers. If you're operating in more than one location, you know, this is even more important. Um, keeping that active inventory of what you have where is so critical, especially if you are impacted. Um, plus, it's also helpful for when you have to do regular maintenance and um, upgrades. So knowing where your equipment is and what's plugged in is, is this network topology is, is worth its weight in gold, for sure. Um, on the application to, uh, topology side, same thing. Um, know what applications you have. You'd be surprised how fast that list grows. It's not as simple as just having an ERP around and, you know, um, a couple uh, third-party applications, but you've got your Tier 1, your Tier 2, your Tier 3 systems. Um, you need to understand... I've seen companies with 50 to 100 different applications in their active environment, and you need to make sure you understand from an IT perspective who the business owner is, what that application is doing for your business, and what databases uh, are involved in running that application, if any. So um, I highly recommend assigning a business owner to every business application 
it's a partnership with the IT team. I think uh, um, having the business understanding also married with the technology side is super critical to getting the application up and running even faster. Uh, and then identify and prioritize revenue generating applications. Have a plan. Should you go out, what are my tier one, tier two, tier three systems? You know, understand which systems bring in that revenue. So typically, you know, in, in ERP is going to be your transactional system. Maybe your CRM is more tier two. You can live a day or two without that CRM. Um, there's maybe your data warehouse, right? That's probably more tier three that you can live probably a week or so without that if you had to. So understanding what applications need to come up first uh, to earn you revenue, but then more importantly, what kind of integrations do you have? I see it quite often when I ask for documentation and business process flows and, and integrations. Rarely can somebody show you a list of the integrations that are occurring at night, what times they're kicked off, what are the downstream integrations that are kicked off along with them. So having that, um, that topology and that roadmap is really critical um, to getting yourselves up and running should you go down as well. And then, I can't stress this enough, don't forget about your phones. Whether or not you're in the cloud with your phones or on premise, even if you're in the cloud, your phones are plugged into your network if you're in the cloud. And if your network's not out, your phones are not out. So understanding how your phone system works um, and how it's designed and whether it's, um, again, if, if the, the circuits, do you have a backup circuit? Um, what's your redundancy plan there? Even if your provider goes out, what is your game plan if your provider goes out? What's your failover? So that's another great um, uh, solution to have ready. Um, and then obviously what I was talking about earlier is defining the organization's recovery point in time. So what is acceptable as far as your recovery point? So for instance, if it's three o'clock, my systems go down. Um, hopefully I don't, uh, I've got a full backup from the night before and I can restore to you know, that prior day. But if you've got the transactional backups going, hopefully you only lose maybe 15 minutes 45 minutes, an hour of data. So there's a recovery point, which could be a daily backup, but then a recovery time. Maybe you're only, or I'm sorry, a recovery time would be two, three hours being down, but that recovery point being maybe an hour of you know, transactions lost. Maybe it's five hours of transactions lost. So sitting down and strategizing that um, governance with the business is critical. Now, I know if ransomware plays a role, <laughs> that kind of might not be a relevant point, but, you know, making sure that you have that plan is, is great for just small daily outages. Um, application installers and license keys. Seen this, been there. This is difficult. Know what applications you have installed, which is plays into number three, the application topology, but then what is the version that you have installed? Do you have the latest license keys? Keep those license keys you know, basically in a virtual safe uh, so that they're easily accessible. Have you, do you have your renewal schedule? Um, again, when you're in a panic mode and you don't know where your license keys and your application installers are, that just delays restore even more. And then, you know, I know this is a nice to have, um, but it might be worth, you know, kind of running through a, a fire drill, um, both internally from a, uh, an organizational perspective, but then um, think about it with your insurance carrier under your cyber uh, insurance. Uh, you know, obviously you hope that you never have to use it, but what is the protocol for if you are impacted and you have to report it? What do you call? What is your first line of defense? Um, who are the players once you get into the phone call? So. Going through a yearly fire drill might not be a bad idea. Um, and then, you know, there's how to prevent, but then what do you do if you're impacted? So again, who are the players? Um, insurance carriers, obviously. Um, the insurance carriers that are gonna probably bring in their uh, legal team. Uh, the legal team is gonna have a group of, now it's 
just unfortunately assume that you might have to pay this ransom um, because for whatever reason, maybe the backup strategy you thought you had in place um, didn't work out so well for you, um, which I hope that's not the case, but let's plan for the worst. Um, you know, there's a whole specialty uh, group out there who will do the negotiations, you know, between uh, the insurance carrier and your organization and with the threat actor. So uh, the threat actor is, I guess, a fancy way to refer to the, the um, hacker themselves. But it's, um, you know, there's a, a whole team of negotiators that will take care of that. And then there'll be a team of forensic response engineers, you know, that will be working with the engineer, with the attorneys, the insurance carriers, and they'll be the ones that will come in, um, whether or not they have a lab on site with you or they have a lab off site. Um, you know, that's, I think, different for every uh, forensic response organization. But, uh, you know, you want to make sure that those are the people that are going to help you decrypt your data um, and, and do the cleansing process. And so those are basically, you know, high level who most of the players are in the process. And then, you know, paying the ransom. I kind of covered this up above, but, you know, you have to decide if you need to pay it. Um, unfortunately, because a lot of the small medium folks are being hit, you know, they're up against the walls that have to pay it. So um, having that backup plan and strategy that we talked about earlier um, really will prove its benefit, you know, downstream. Um, once you pay it, what happens? You know, you're probably going to have your bank transfer money over to, you know, the negotiators and negotiators are going to handle that currency, um, that currency transfer into Bitcoin. They'll pay the threat actors off. Um, you know, how long does it typically take? It, these guys are really um, pretty girls, too. Um, they're really big on their reputation. So, you know, it could take 12 to 24 hours to get that decryption key back. So once you get it. Um, you know, you have to get to work right away. And then, you know, you have to think about, um, you know, getting that data decrypted as soon as possible. So, you know, Brad, if we want to skip to that next one, this is the part where, um, you know, there are various types of impacts. You know, there's the operating system layer, the email layer, the application layer, um, just because I know we're running short on time. Um, you know, the forensic team is going to look at the type of impact. You know, they're going to look and they're going to spend weeks investigating where the intrusion occurred. Did it come into the operating system there? Um, a lot of times what you'll see happen is these guys will get into your active directory. They'll create themselves an account. They'll be an administrator. They'll be able to circle around and do whatever they want. They'll create themselves an email account. Then they'll just act as though they were an employee in your organization. And they may sit there for months, maybe a year. And they'll know a lot about your organization beside, before they decide to actually set its executable off. Um, email layer, most common occurrence. Um, and then there's the application layer. And this is the part where it's really critical to determine, did the intruder make its way into the application layer and compromise you know, patient, customer, payment card information? Should you have that stored in the application layer? So this will take weeks and months and, and could be up to years to, to get through that type of forensics. And then the recovery piece of it, um, you know, this is this is going to be chaotic. Uh, multiple work streams are going to be happening at the same time. You're going to be rebuilding your infrastructure. You have to remember that if you're impacted, and this spreads throughout your entire organization, and you're off into multiple locations, you're going to have an infrastructure team that's focused on data center, uh, cleaning endpoints from computers to payment card processors, if you're in the medical field, think about medical scanners, anything that's running software, you have to clean and reformat. And that could be extremely tedious if you're spread across the nation. Um, you're gonna have a team completely dedicated to rebuilding your network and your firewall. You're also gonna have a team that's dedicated to restoring data and databases. So, you know, expect those multiple work streams to be traveling at the same time and you're, you're you know, you want to plan that they all converge right at the right time so that your business is up and running. Even if it's 40 or 50 percent, you want them earning revenue as soon as possible. Um, data uh, transport between facilities. So there's a process when you're going through the forensics piece of this. You know, you want to make sure that uh, the data being downloaded uh, onto external devices and being transported from the infected site to the lab and back to the clean site 
you want to make sure you have a good chain of custody, uh, proper documentation, um, tracking who's responsible for carrying that device from point A to point B. And then the recovery process is, you know, people think, oh, I'll be up and running on Monday if I'm hit by Friday. It's not really that, you know, easy. You know, the, there's a process of, if you're talking about terabytes of data, there's a process for copying that data down, um, decrypting it, cleansing it, and copying it. And then the database restores the staging and validating of the data, making sure that the users, you know, um, can validate that the data is good. And then reinstalling all those applications. So you can remount those databases, but remember, having those application installers and those software license keys are so important because you have to reinstall all those applications. So Great. I know I talked really fast. Sorry about that, Brad, but I ran short no. on time. So. No, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's right at 1130. So if you, those of you on the call today uh, need to go, we definitely understand. But I do want to take a quick moment to open it up to questions uh, just real quickly before I do so. Uh, our contact information is on the screen. If you have any questions or if you're interested in learning more about our ransomware recovery services or really any of the services that we provide, please reach out. We're happy to talk to you. And so, yeah, that's on the screen. Uh, we'll open it up to questions. I know that we did have one come in uh, during the presentation, but those can continue to come in. Just uh, submit those in the chat or Q&A portal. So the one that came in was, um, it sounds like a lot of tasks are performed by outside parties, like you mentioned, insurance companies, attorneys, uh, et cetera. Is there a point person from our company? Uh, is that typically how that works? And what role does LTA play in this process? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so having gone through one, I think the best way to explain LTA's role in, in a recovery process is we represent the customer's best interest. You know, with respect to, um, you know, you've got forensic teams, you've got attorneys, you've got insurance carriers. Um, you know, they all are obviously interested in getting you up and running, but do they really, are they really interested in getting you up and running as fast as possible with the best, you know, with the, the most reasonable amount of security as fast as possible? And remember, you know, you might see some unfortunate, really bad practices out there with respect to your, your, you're running a thousand miles an hour with many people having submitting SOWs for their emergency work and all their specialties, um, and you're willing to pay for whatever it takes to get your business up and running. Um, and some people might take advantage of that. And I think where LTA comes into play is. You know, they understand the multiple work streams that are required to get you up and running. They understand the expertise that's required. They have an idea of, a strong idea, I should say, of what it takes, um, you know, a level of effort and level of time to get those work streams up and running. So um, it's, it's, it's really good to have that project management in place uh, with LTA so that they understand how those different work streams are gonna to come together at the same time. And like I said, get that revenue coming through the door as fast as possible. Great, we got another one that came in here. Uh, what kind of protections, if any, are there um, once you pay a ransom from it happening again? I don't think you can ever be 100% prepared, unfortunately. I think you just have to com just continuously be evolving in your best practices routine from the maintenance to your application updates, your security updates, um, making sure your firmware um, uh, is, is up to date as possible. Um, what's your, um, you know, uh, when do you retire certain assets and um, um, try not to keep them around for too long? You know, there, there's so many different practices out there, um, but having, again, the playbook in place um, and never taking anything for granted, I think is, you know, really, uh, like I said, it's, a, it's an ongoing practice. I don't think you can ever fully prevent it, but you can prepare. Great. Um, I've got one more that came in. Again, any questions? I know there's still um, a, a handful of people on. Uh, please submit those. Um, so the question is, 
with regards to email, I feel that it's often user error or bad decision making uh, that leads to either exposure or vulnerability. Uh, do you have any tips on how to address that? Well, you can, there are software um, applications out there that you can uh, deploy uh, with your end user base to sort of um, give them a test. Little, little do they know that they're going through a test, but you can, um, you know, push out emails that look like they might be, you know, um, throughout the organization and you can grade your, your end base, um, you know, on how successful they are at clicking on bad links and um, these phishing scams. So you can, you can plant the learning, um, the phishing scams yourself and see if, uh, how many users bite and then you'll know um, who you have to train and um, pull them aside and give them some extra um, training uh, with respect to how you use email. So. Um, I think you can do some self-imposed training um, to prevent that from happening. Education is probably the best way to go about it. Yeah, awesome. Uh, well, those are all the questions that I have. We'll do a last call. Um, but again, if any questions come up, uh, whether it be later this afternoon, next week, uh, definitely reach out to Nicole or myself. We are here to help. and. Um, so it doesn't look like we've gotten any more questions. So with that, Nicole, I want to thank you for joining us today. It was very informational. And uh, thank you to everyone else who was able to attend. Thanks, Brad. Thank you.